probably hopefully you saw this pop up your email list, but to help facilitate you all telling me which problems you would like to see. I just made little votes, uh, little polls for each um, problem set. And some people have voted on, on those, for example. A couple of votes for here, right? So as you're working through these problems each week, if you give me a day in advance, I'll check these in a day in advance and I'm prep the day, you know, the day for the class and try to pick you know the highest voted one to go over. Alright, so I did that this morning. Um, I, I worked out I worked out this problem and we'll go over it today. Alright? And then um, Oh, we had, I, I felt like we had a very nice office hour session yesterday. Um, got the board covered in equations and uh, used different colored markers and all kinds of fun things. So, um, and talked about projects and started to get into the details. So, come and talk to me and hang out. I, I love talking about this stuff and I'll talk to you forever. You're probably, and we ended up being there two hours instead of one. Um, so, you're, I'm easily seduced at talking about dynamics. So just come visit me, right? And, and we'll hack these things out. I'm, uh, I think we, uh, we did the whole problem three on the board from the exam in detail. And I think you, you got, what do you feel like? You feel like you got that better now? Yeah? So come hang out and we'll figure, thing, figure this stuff out. So um, and then, that, and then that, that's that. And uh, I feel like there was one more thing to say. Um, in general, you should be getting getting these kinematics solidified for your project, right? You should be able to write um, the angular the angular velocity and angular accelerations of all the bodies, and the um, linear velocities and accelerations of all the centers of masses where your center of masses may be. All right, so that's what you're going to be shooting for for your for your kinematics. Um, and then, yeah, I feel like there was one more thing I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, any any questions? So last time we talked about principal axes. Um, I want to... Um, Let's I'm trying to think which one should I do first? Maybe it doesn't matter. But uh, if you want to open up um, Jupiter here and follow along, uh, we'll we'll start with that. And I'm going to do two problems. One, I want to do, I want to take we we got somewhere in the principal axes stuff, but I wanted to be a little more explicit how uh, about a couple of things, and we're going to work out a problem. And then also we're going to do problem. Uh, Five eight, which I can show show you too. So let's let's just start with the principal axes uh, stuff, and then I'll do problem five eight, and we'll try to do those in the first hour. Um, and if you get tired of typing this these first three lines, um, you can create a Python startup script that would run these. And I'm, I'm tired of ty typing use LaTeX and pretty print. It used to work without that, but there's currently a bug in SymPy that this is the workaround, which you, you may have may, not, may or may not have come across. Okay, so um, oh yeah, I was going to show you. I've got this uh, Eden uh, F1000 research. So I showed you that um, Eden program pram last time that had uh, calculates the um, inertia of the human body given some measurements of the person and their configuration. I wrote a little paper on this. Um, and 
you could read more about it if you want, but the, this is what I, the reason I wrote this was because <clears throat> I had to constantly calculate um, the moments of inertia of a person sitting on a bicycle for my PhD work. Um, I, mean, I don't know if I've told you what I did for my dissertation, but I um, wrote about how humans balance and control on bicycles. And it's sort of a big, um, it's a vehicle dynamics problem and a biomechanics problem. You squish them together and then add um, control system from, your, from the human brain, and, uh, and then you got this big, nasty system. But uh, one thing I had always have was the moments of inertia of bicycles and the moments of inertia of uh, people. And this notebook might be one that's useful, but it's a, it's a pretty um, maybe long and complex uh, way to um, figure out. I use, uh, ultimately, we don't need to go through the details, but ultimately I um, take a kinematic um, description of a human and I build up some constraints that make sure he, that human always sits on the bicycle in a proper way. And then I calculate the moments of inertia of the person sitting in that particular form and, um, and I calculate the moments of inertia from the, from the bicycle. And, um, and depending on what kind of model you want to use, you might assume that, oh, the person's legs are rigidly attached to the frame, but only their body can move. Um, or maybe all their body can move and only their um, hips are attached to the bicycle frame. So you've got to combine some inertias of the person with the bicycle frame, depending on how you model the system. And uh, this is not good. There we go. The, um, uh, let me just get to the peak. Ultimately, I, I, get that, I can get that Yeadon guy sitting on the, on the bike. On any given bike that I give it, it has different sizes. And any given person that also has different sizes, it always sits them on the bike properly, right, given locations of a seat and a handlebar. And, uh, and then I have to do, you know, inertia manipulations here to combine the inertia of the person with the bike. So that's what you, you guys, I'll give you the link to this if you want to look at it in that paper, but um, this is, it's a good thing to look through to see how a lot of different inertia manipulations are done for a complex uh, body. All right, so that was the impetus. Um, so the only reason I told you that was that I'm going to now tell you the I'm going to give you a description of the inertia of, a, uh, of just the rear frame of a bicycle with a person sitting on it, considered that the person is fully rigid and attached to the bicycle frame. And um, those values, we'll call it IBXX. I'm just going to give you the inertia scalars. Um, and these are in uh, kg meters squared. Uh, IBYY equals 11, IBZZ equals uh, 2.8, and then IBXZ equals 2.4. All right, and the um, coordinates that I have here are, uh, here's a bicycle frame, sorry, Right, some bicycle frame, and there's a stick person sort of sitting on it. Their legs go like this, head, right, handlebars, something like that. Um, if I make Z and X those coordinates, and that's typical for vehicles uh, to have Z pointing down there. Um, and then the bodies that I'm talking about, I'll just sort of erase these two or just the inertia of the person in this rear bike, in this rear part of the bicycle frame. And they have a center of mass. This person center mass is probably about right here. Maybe the bicycle pulls it down a little bit. And we'll call that point O and this body B. Okay? So those are the, those are the uh, inertia scalars for this body B with respect to point O expressed with res in this reference frame. Okay, so we can um, we can create that. Let's call um, let's call this 
um, the inertial reference frame in. And then if I uh, create, create that reference frame, this keyboard is funny. And, and then I can um, create I of B with respect to O. And um, I'll do that by using the inertia command. And I give it 9.2, uh, 11.0, 2.8. And then I um, ZX is the same as IXZ. We have the inertia matrix. Uh, um, we have uh, symmetric matrices. So I can create that and get an error because I forgot the frame. And then we have this inertia dyadic. Okay? And then if I uh, do IBO mat equals IBO two matrix and N, you can see it in that matrix form expressed to expressed as a uh, tensor in that frame in. Okay? But recall that this, that this one is um, basis independent and this one's basis dependent. Okay, so that's our inertia matrix. It, um, it has zeros on the XY, right, and the uh, YZ terms. This thing has some symmetry. It has a symmetry about this uh, plane here. And, um, and that symmetry in the XZ plane means that we are only going to get products in the XZ plane, but none in the um, other two coordinates. Okay? So it only has symmetry about this one plane. And so we may have mass distributed funny in this plane, and that's why the product shows up. Uh, but we're not going to have mass. If I look at it from here, um, the mass is going to be in the same place on both sides of the plane, and we won't have products of inertia associated with sort of skewed distribution of mass um, relative to, to that plane there. Okay? So, so we've got that. Now let's um, see if we can find the principal um, axes and the principal moments of inertia. Right? We should be able to express this and we should be able to convert this inertia dyadic into one that is, if you recall, um, three measure numbers, just the pr uh, principal moments of inertia, uh, times three new unit inertia dyadics, uh, three new unit dyadics that are aligned with the principal axes. Okay? What's the, la the last thing that I wrote? That the principal inertia, I of... Um, uh, body B with respect to point O equals um, I1 S hat plus I2 S2 hat plus I3 S3 hat. All right, so these inertia, unit inertia dyadics, those are the principal, associated with the principal axes, and these are the moments of inertia, uh, principal moments of inertia. So how do we calculate that? Well, we've got this matrix, and um, we don't have a, a convenience function, so you don't have to convert it to matrices first, but um, the current process is uh, we can create this eigenvectors, which is called eigenvex because it gives us um, everything we want. And then I'm going to uh, store that in something called eig, eig result. Uh, I hate this keyboard. Okay. So it gives us three sets of things, right, where one set is in a tuple. So we have a list of three tuples. First tuple, the first item in the first tuple is the eigenvalue. Um, this is the, um, uh, uh, what's the word I want? How, whether this eigenvalue is repeated or not. If there's two of the same eigenvalue, it would be two, three, three. And then it has a, oddly, I don't like this, 
output, but it gives you a list of matrices. And the reason it gives you a list is because um, you can have two different eigenvectors associated with one, eigenve one pair of eigenvalues that are the same eigenvalues. So if I had two, two for two, two of the same eigenvalue, this would give me two eigenvectors associated with that. So that's why it comes in a list. Anyways, it's annoying to sort of parse this out. So I'm going to write a little function here in Python that just that I call parse i to turn it into a form that I that I want to have it in, and it's going to take a single um, um, I tuple, we'll call it. And what I want to do is um, first I want to get the um, the eigenvalue, and that's going to be the first thing in the I tuple. And and then I need to get um, the eigenvector, which is just this column matrix. So I'll call it E um, E vec. Let's call evec uh, matrix, right? And that's going to be the eig tuple. It's the um, last item in that tuple. And then the first one out, out of there will, will give me uh, what we want for this case. And then I'm going to, um, this is only in a column matrix form. Let's put it back into the, the vectors that we're normally working with, right? These, uh, simple, these mechanics vectors. So I'm going to write a little loop. I'm going to say for measure number, and I can give it, uh, be more explicit there, for measure number um, in, the eigen, in that eigenvector and the um, uh, unit vector of n, n, I'm going to use this function zip that will sort of Combine two lists of things. The first list is going to be the eigenvec mat. So if I iterate through each of the entries in that in that column matrix, I'll get the measure number I want. And then I'm going to iterate through. I'll create my own list. I want n x, n y, and n z. Right, and that's a for loop. It's going to iterate through th these pairs of three things. So zip just pairs up. The first thing in VEC with the first thing in the second one. Second thing, third thing. And then it makes them available as me the variable's measured number. All right, so I got my loop. And now I can, um, oh, I forgot one thing. Before my loop, I'm going to create a EVEC equals um, a zero length vector. Um, okay? And then I'll use, um, I'm going to just sum, and I'm using the syntactic notation here. Um, I'm going to, I want to add to evec measure number times unit vector, right, to create each of the components of that vector. And plus equals let's, is, a, uh, is equivalent to saying evec equals evec plus measure num times unit vec. And actually, um, yeah, measure number times unit vec. I can just delete that and do plus equals. All right, so it'll, it'll add those things to it. So this is going to create a vector, a mechanics vector, that uses these measure numbers and re reacquaints them with um, the unit vectors that we had before. Okay. So I should get point, negative 0.33 in x, 0 in y, 1 in z. There's one thing here, though. SymPy does not return eigenvectors that are um, normalized, that are, un that are of unit length. OK? So if I uh, square root of the sums of the squares of these components, it's not going to be 1. We want these to be um, these vec evex that we create. We're going to want to make them unit vectors, all right? So I have this evec, but I'm going to do. I'm going to now return the eval uh, eigenvalue, and then I'm going to do evec dot normalize. Now that I have a mechanics vector, I can find its um, 
turn it into a unit vector. Find a unit vector that's aligned with that. Okay, so this little function, which probably we should incorporate into SIMPA and, and save, um, now I can uh, do parse eig and give it um, my eig result, the first tuple in that. And we should get something here. We'll get an error. See what I did wrong. Uh, fake object has no attribute baseline. I don't know what the heck that is. But it printed out the result I wanted. <laughs> oh, geez. That, that, might, that may or may not be, be one. All right. So it um, created now the uh, at first eigenvector. And it should be, it looks a little funny. Oh, no. It should be right because we normalized it. What the heck is this error? Is this associated with? Oh, it's the same. This is the bug. The reason that I typed this up here, we want to turn pretty printing off, and I'll just run all, everything again. There we go. That that's the bug that I've been. I've got an issue open in Simpy to fix it. All right. So what it did is it, it gave me the eigenvalue, and then it gave me the um, eigenvector here normalized. Okay, so this is now a unit vector. And that just will help me extract these. So let's go ahead and get eigenvalue 1 and eigenvec 1 equals parse eig. Eig result, the zeroth. And then I can just copy that. And we'll get the second one. And the third one, third, second, and this will be the one and two there. So now if I look at like evec one, I get this. And if I take its magnitude, I get one. All right, so I have unit eigenvectors that are associated with each eigenvalue, which is a scalar. some more screen real estate. None of the shortcut keys work in Windows like other operating systems. Okay. Anybody not there yet? You're not? Where are you? Where, where at? And what does it say? Oh, yeah. So that's probably that we had to get the last item in the tuple, and that's a list. Uh, the, this one is a list of, let's just look at that more explicitly. My eig result, if I get the first item, I get one of those tuples, right? And then if I take the uh, last thing in that one, so I've got to do the first tuple and the last item in the tuple, I get this. And this, I, uh, let's just check this type because it's easier to convince you. Eig result 0, negative 1. It's a list. So then, Eig result 0, negative 1, um, z the 0 thing in the list gives me that, which should be a matrix, and that's what we want, right? So that's a matrix. And then if I do um, four thing in matrix, I iterate through that, print thing, that's going to that's gonna loop through. So I think you may not have the matrix there if you got that iteration. It may be trying to iterate that. So make sure that you're going to pass that into your function. And then inside your function, that's how you extract the eigenvector. Those last two, negative 1, 0. Um, and yeah, you can see if you have, check and see if you have any errors. 
associated with how I wrote it. Everybody else got it, got it working there? All right. So, uh, SymPy is written in Python. We've only used like the SymPy mechanics things mostly now, but this is a Python function and a Python for loop. Um, you know, you can use the power of the full programming language to help you do things, and it becomes very useful um, in more complicated problems when you got lots of degrees of freedom. Maybe you want to loop through a bunch of things or whatever. Maybe you want to create a thousand bodies for I for a thousand, you know, different things like that. But um, Python has got all those standard tools you may need. Is it working, Chris? Can somebody back there help help him? Maybe. Okay. So now we have these eigenvectors in in, in evex. The next thing I want to do is um, so those we've got S1, S2, and S3, and maybe I should have named it that. We could now create a reference frame um, with those. Those are mutually perpendicular um, unit vectors, and we could create a new reference frame with those. There's a way to create a reference frame that uh, you construct the direction cosine matrix by hand. So if I create a matrix here, and I'm going to create a 3 by 3, so um, I can do n dot x dot with, uh, I think I call it evec1, and then n dot, um, which order did I do this? Yeah, first row will be all n dot x's, and then uh, evec two n dot x dot evec three. So this gives me the angles between at n x and that new uh, and those three eigen vectors, right? And I can create. I'll just copy this, create a new row and a new row, and then we just need to um, change the next row to y, ny, 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 z, z, z. So here I have the direction cosine matrix that relates n to s, right? This new principal component. Um, Rotation and notice that we got a, an entry here one. So um, all it's doing, since due to the symmetry, is just picking some axes, and we're rotating about the y axis here to pick those principles. Um, it's not going to shift and rotate about this, um, anything that would give us principal axes that are not aligned with the plane of symmetry of the of the bicycle rider. So let's create S. We'll say n dot orient new s, and there's a DCM. I can't remember if it's capital or not. DCM, and then I can just give it that matrix, and then s dot DCM n, you know, is now now stored there for for us to use. Okay. Now let's create a new inertia dyadic, right? It's I of the bicycle with respect to O, same thing. And then we're going to do ME inertia and the S, but now we're going to give it eval 1, eval 2, and eval 3 only. And actually, I'm going to name it uh, different than the one we had before. So IB and O, um, S. Let's just say that we created it using the S-frame. Right? So that's what we expect. We have principal moments of inertia aligned with the principal axes. Okay? And then above, we had I, B, O, which was the inertia dyadic where we specified the inertia with respect to these axes. All right. Now, 
This equation here, recall that an inertia dyadic is um, basis independent. Okay? So I, I don't have to know what frame it is. We, we happen to express and create this inertia dyadic, both of them using a single reference frame. But my claim is, is that these two inertia dyadics are the exact same thing. Okay? So you can do things now like I B O dot express in S. And if it weren't for floating point error on the computer, we got the same thing, right? So IBO was this one that we we gen, we expre, we created that inertia dyadic just by writing the uh, measure numbers for the unit dyadics in the n frame, and then we created this one by writing the s frame. But s and n are related by that rotation matrix. So now I get that I get the same thing, right? If I express IBO in terms of s, I, I, I get that back. So these, in, in fact, are identical. Dyadics. And all I'm doing is expressing them in different reference frames. So if I I B O S dot express an N, I get I get the original expression. Right? So the key, th the key thing here is that um, an inertia dyadic um, can be written in terms of any unit dyadics from any reference frame that you want, right? There's a special set of unit dyadics called the principal axes such that we will only have three moments of inertia that fully describe the inertia of that body. And... Um, and then in general, there are six unique values associated with the nine entries of that inertia tensor. And uh, this shows us how we can um, compute the inert, compute the, we computed the principal, the, um, principal moments of inertia and the principal axes, constructed a new reference frame aligned with that principal axes. And uh, in fact, we could figure out the angle here. So Here's x, right? There's an sx somewhere. Um, if we wanted to know, if we have, um, right, S, sx dotted with nx is going to be the cosine of the angle between those two unit vectors, right? So I can do sm dot a cos this 1.89 and that's supposed to be between z 1 and 0 and 1 or 1 and negative 1 and 1 um, and then um, 1.89 uh, rate that's in radians, so uh, times 180 over 2 pi. Fifty-four degrees. So is that right? So S is something like this. S X and S uh, Z. And that's that 54 degrees. Okay? I think that's correct. Questions on that? It's useful to express um, inertia in terms of principal moments of inertia and, and their axes oft, often if you have complex bodies. And, uh, and they happen to align with 
geometrical and um, mass dis distribution symmetry. Okay. Other questions? That all makes sense. Everybody's computation work. Chris, did yours get worked out? No. All right. Well, I'll have to help you after class. I think. I'm not. I'm not just minor, minor error, probably. You can. I'll post this notebook. Okay. Problem five eight um, says we have a sheet of paper with this dimension. We draw a line on it, right, and then uh, roll it to make a cylinder. And pick some axes, call this N1, N2, and uh, N3. And then this line uh, forms a helix going from uh, N2. Rotates one time to get up to back a full 180 degrees. And we'll call that H, right? And so that's like an infinitesimally thin line in 3D space, but it has mass m. It has a mass m. And the question is basically, what is inertia scalar I1 and inertia scalar I2, where this thing uh, so we've got it's like a, imagine a thin wire uniform dens density has mass M and we want to know the inertia of that. Where do you think, where do we start? Any thoughts on that? Do you need the center mass to calculate the inertia? It says. Oh, with respect to, um, what does it say there? Yeah, exactly. I forget. Yes, you do need the center mass if we want to express it about that point. We don't. Have you don't know. How, you don't have to. But what do they say? Body mass be blah, 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 blah. relative to the mass center of B. Yeah. So what do you think the mass center of B if that's going to be? Right in the middle. Yeah. If I uh, if the wire is straight, the mass center is here, and if I curve it, it's going to just pull pull it into the center of the thing. So this is just going to be here, and this is a. Uh, once again, height B, and then this is going to this should be a B over two. All right, what's next? Yeah. So we talked um, only in class that we talk about if I if I can make an infinite number of points and uh, find their location relative to this point. Do we name this point? We'll just call it uh, H O. Uh, relative to H O, <clears throat> that we could 
probably calculate the moment of inertia. But with a continuous thing, where we, ha we do have an infinite number of points, um, there are integral forms of the summations that I showed you. So let's look at that real quick. Um, Ah, I don't think I have a way to open a PDF. Do I? Um, I can just jump over to this real quick, just to show that uh, document camera. So if we go to chapter three, the beginning. We have an uh, inertia vector that I, we described in terms of collection of points. And then at the bottom of the next page, we've got these. So if I want a, an inertia IA, then I do the integral over some um, infinitely small chunk of material. Uh, with respect to that same cross product here. And then here's the, in that case, uh, density could be a function of, uh, of the position of that particle, but ours is going to be constant, so we're going to pull that out of the in integral there. Okay? And then to find an inertia scalar, we can just dot it with whatever axis we're interested in, and we get that inertia scalar. So I suggest we use this equation. And <clears throat> we're going to need to make an equation that describes, um, we already have in A, right? That's going to be in 1 and in 2. We we're going to make P here. So let's get some, we'll, I'm going to do, do this all with SimPy, and I need to go back to the computer. Um, we have A, B, and um, A, B, that gives one more parameter. Oh, yeah, a row. So let's create those. A, B, and row. And um, I'm also going to add a, a variable um, theta here. And, he said, and then we want to create P that is something times, uh, let's get a reference frame, N equals ME reference frame N. P equals something times in X plus something times in Y plus something times in Z. So how, if we want to write that function of P is going to be from HO to any point on the, on the, on the helix. Well, any suggestions on that? And then we have, this is the x direction, is the vertical one. If I suggest that we, um, how do you describe a helix in terms of x, y, and z? Yeah, so if I do radius A times uh, SM cos of the angle theta, and then A times 
has some sine of the angle theta. Right, that, that describes a parameterized circle. If I pick an angle theta, it's going to move me around in a circle in that plane. And now all I need is, as theta changes, how do I go up? So what would be the relationship in terms of theta and the variables that we have that would make me go up at the proper you know, rate given the angle theta? Or not the proper, or the proper distance given the angle theta. Might be useful to think about this. That's two pi times the radius. Right? That's the whole rotation. So that's theta a. Parameterizing it. Parameterizing in terms of theta. Yeah. Theta is your, I guess you could say, your independent variable or your, I guess, in the height and position on the circle, your independent variable. Yep. I, kind of like the other way around where I parameterize it in terms of height away from the center of mass, and then theta I wrote as a function of the height. Yeah, we could do that too. Um, either, either one will work. You want to do that? Can you can you tell me uh, which you, you can? Um, what does what this parameterized term is going to set us up is when we take that integral, we're going to integrate it along, along that variable. It's the key thing. So you could integrate along the height, or you can integrate along theta in this case. And there's another there's other sets of coordinates that you could use to parameterize these things. Um, Let's. You want to do? Do you got? You know yours. Sure. Um, I just instead of theta, I use the variable I call x one. All right. So just x one in the ten x direction. So p, and it's going to be uh, in the in x, yeah, in x direction. So x one times in x. Plus, and then what are my? Hey, cosine. Uh, in this case, it's two pi x one over p. Two times sm dot pi times. Sorry, cosine. Uh, cosine of what? Cosine of two pi x one over b. X one over b. Uh, plus sm dot cos. I'm mean, sine, right? Mm -hmm. Of uh, two times. SM dot pi times X one over B. So X is the distance from the center of mass in the in one direction. Does that look right? That's what I have Does that look right? Okay, so now if I oh, change x, it's going to point to me at the right spot. So let's think about that. If I put in uh, x equals 0, then I get 0 in the z. This is a cosine of 0, which is 1 in the y. 
That puts us right here. It starts in the y. So one, one in the y should be a. I'm oh, sorry, zero is here. So I should start with, uh, I'm missing then um, something to get me to this location, the b over 2, right? It needs to. Um, I, this is, that's the center of the bottom circle, that's the center of the top circle. I just drew my axes randomly there, so they're a little higher up. Maybe to, yeah, I just, I'm just drawing my um, unit vectors here in the correct orientation. I could, I could put them here too, right? They're all the same. Okay, so now we still want to know the distance from HO to some point. This is P. All right, so then if that's the case, um, yeah, you don't need that B, B over 2. So you got X1. So if, I, if, it's a, if, if, if X1 is 0, then I'm here. And then I have negative 1 in the y, which it should be 0 in the, in the what should it be? The so y is in, uh, but my y is in 2. That's one problem, too. I should show you how to do the, um, well, the, uh, this is y, y. Z, X, and uh, the helix starts at um, X1 equals uh, minus B over 2, and, um, and it has this point here is uh, coordinates is um, A in the Y direction, so uh, P of of the initial point one, uh, the first point, this one, we'll call that P1, is uh, negative B over 2 in the in x positive A in Y. All right, we agree on that. So does this, if I plug in um, negative B over 2, I get that. And if I plug in negative b over 2 here, uh, the b over 2's cancel. And I get a negative pi. Cosine of negative pi um, is negative 1. And then I got a negative, so I got a positive 1. And if I had my a in there, that would be right. OK. We're on the same page. Let's add the a. No, it's the same as the other one. Uh, the way I did it, I parameterized it with the angle. And, and Okay, but now we'll integrate through the height using this equation. So that's P. And recall that um, we can do P dot cross with um, N dot, in our case, we'll start with N1 dot cross P. So that's that triple, that'll be double cross product that transforms P into this, this bit. But it's the integral now, and we're going to go from um, negative B over 2 to B over 2 of rho P crossed n1 crossed p, right? And then we're going to integrate over um, your x1 coordinate, okay? And that should give us the that should give us the vector about n1. And then we dot that, and we get the scalar associated with it. So we've got almost there. We could add. Um, 
the row term to it, but the row comes out of the integral. So let's just hold on to that. Right? Row's constant. We'll just forget about that. The integral of this. Um, Simpy, unfor unfortunately, I can't just take the integral of a mechanics vector in SymPy. Um, we don't have that functionality. We could make it, but that's a, if you guys want to contribute something to it, you can add, add that, uh, make the integral work. So uh, let's store this as, um, I'll just call it inside integral right there. And, but what we can do is I can express this, I'm sorry, I can uh, convert this to a matrix in, using in. And that just gives us the measure numbers of that vector, in, in. Simpy knows how to integrate this. So if I do sm.integrate that matrix, comma, through x1, the variable x1, and we're going to go from negative b over 2 to b over 2. Okay? So this is going to be, and that's going to do a definite integral because I gave it limits of integration. And that's going to give us the integral of this thing, and we'll just call that, um, let's call it solution. Oops. Need one more parenthesis. Oh, I don't know what I did there. Inside int. Oh no, sm. Sm dot integrate. Okay, so that will integrate each of those things. But it said, oh, what if b is 0? And it gives us a piecewise. Um, SymPy assumes that everything that you create is a complex value and that it could be any number. So what we'll do here is say um, all of those values are going to be positive. And then just run your code again. Oh, yeah, that was delete that cell. Run your code down that integral, and there we go. If I integrate from negative b over 2 to b over 2, I get this. Okay? And then we could um, sort of recreate. This is a vector, remember? So let's call this i a 1 equals, and then I'm going to do, um, remember we had rho, still needs to be there, times, and then we're going to have uh, solution, the first item in the solution times nx plus the second item times ny plus the third item times n. Z. So there we've calculated the inertia vector with, uh, with respect to HO and the line that passes through HO uh, that's parallel to N1. And maybe we should call, let's just say this is with respect to HO to be more explicit. Okay, so that's a vector, the inertia vector. And the last thing is we want the inertia scalar. Okay, and if we want the 1, I1, we can do I1. Did he ask for the inertia scalars or what? I feel like he showed this form. Chapter 5. 
he says, uh, oh, he just shows the vectors. Show that the vectors are, are this. So we've got, um, he has it in terms of mass. We still have it in terms of rho. Okay, so we're close. That's the first, first one. How do we convert rho to, what's the relationship between rho and mass? Density and it's uniform densely, and then we got mass. So density is some kind of like this mass per something. And if this is a, the density of the whole object, that's the total mass. Then we need the total length, right? But I think there's a key thing here that um, we integrated with respect to the x, x, -coord x coordinate. And that went, the total is b, right? So this is um, mass per unit length b. So if I, if I go along the integration variable, a total distance of b, any, um, maybe to write this, dm equals um, uh, rho times dx1, the variable that Josh chose. And then if I integrate both of those from negative b over 2 to b over 2, then I'm going to get mass equals rho b, right? And then rho equals m over b. We can plug, plug that in to get the final answer. So if I do i1 h o dot subs rho is m of b. We never, divide, we never created m, maybe. m equals sn dot symbols m. That should be his answer. Is that his answer? For that i1? What did I do with my book? I think so. Yeah. I'll let you all do I2. Questions on that one? Key thing was we had to use the integral form. Chris? Oh, yeah. So in SymPy, um, it has the concept of assumptions. So I might say, well, this variable could be only positive, or this variable is real, or this variable is only an integer, or this variable is uh, only odd or even. Right? There's a long list of different assumptions that you can associate with a symbolic thing. And um, because SymPy didn't know that B couldn't be zero. Um, actually, yeah, if we make B zero, it has no, no inertia, right? If it didn't know that, um, then it threw in that, uh, it said if B is zero, then something, and it made a piecewise solution to that. So I added positive there to ensure all those that somebody knows. Right there, rho. But I meant uh, mathematically. You said rho equals m over b. Wouldn't it be m over the length of the line? 
Um, no, because, yeah, this is a little detail. Um, if we integrated along DL of the line, then yes, but we didn't. We, we took DMs as we walked up. So th this is the equation that has to hold to get rho correctly. All right, so I said from negative b to b over 2 to b over 2, um, rho times some infinitesimal dx of that line. And it's sort of like drawing, uh, if this, this was your coordinate x, right? And so if I chunk out one of these pieces, this is dx. And if I add up all the dx's, and if I multiply each dx times rho and add them up, I get total mass, right? So that's total mass. And if you don't, yeah, if you if you use um, L, and maybe maybe I need should be maybe I should have left rho in the integral, right? Um, dx equals It's a constant value. Uh, yeah. Hey, why is that? Can somebody else explain that? What's the? Uh, it only works out if you do that. It's. Um, I mean, this is true, right? I don't. I don't not believe that. Um, but if I were to do row. D, say I make a coordinate along along the line called uh, L. Rho D L has to be for two different integration limits. It's not from negative B over 2 to B over 2, right? It's going to be something associated with the sums and squares of B and A. And when I put the correct integration limits in there, I think I would also get that relationship, too. And I guess you could do, uh, you could probably, can you break that up into a double integral? Probably can do that, too. Uh, does anybody have a better explanation for that? Why, why is that true? Yeah, I'm confused myself. Okay, let's take a break. Come back in five minutes. On that, besides this one that I don't have an answer to at the moment. Um. Okay, good. So at least a couple people liked that we did two, did two problems and did them with Senpai. Again. I'll keep try to keep that up. I'm uh, I wish I know what know why this. The explanation here, it's gonna bug me. <laughs> All Alrighty, <clears throat> so that's it for chapter three. Now let's move into chapter four. Talk about forces and torques, or collectively, I uh, use the term loads sometimes too. <clears throat> so, um, 
we've been working with vectors so far that are, um, uh, and maybe we um, realized that in the example before, uh, that our vectors don't have to be attached to a point. Okay, so um, vector so far. Um, don't have what's called a, a line of action. Okay. Um, we don't associate that vector with a particular line in, in, in space. Uh, but if a vector is associated with a line, then um, they have a specific name. And they're called bound vectors. Right? And then um, the vectors we've already been working with um, are called free vectors. Forces and torques are going to be bound vectors. Um, and then everything we've talked about so far are just free vectors. All right, so an example is if I have the rigid body potato, then there's a point P on it. And maybe I'm applying a force to that point P. And it's directed along a line that passes through point P. And it's associated with that point P. So forces have magnitude, direction, um, and essentially a point that's going to be associated with them, right? Where do we apply that force? And then um, the free, a free vector, this is bound, and then a free vector is like what we've seen, right? If I have a rigid body that's in, oops, it's in space. Come on. It may have some angular velocity of uh, body B. In A, but I can I can draw that anywhere I want, right? I can draw it here. I make it be in A. I can even I don't even have to draw it on the body. And this is one thing we talked about for a while in office hours Tuesday. Um, there was some confusion on problem three about what the angular velocity I think of that plate was that's sliding on the table, and um, and some of the thoughts were associated with thinking that. Omega has to be tied to a point. Okay, points don't have angular velocities, but a reference frame relative to another reference frame does in this case, and we can express that as a free vector. It just has to have the correct magnitude and orient in that direction, whereas a force though has to be directed along this line of action that goes through a point of interest, and that's going to be the same for torques too. Um, if I have a torque between two bodies. I'd right, say that these two bodies here um, have an angle between them, <clears throat> and I want to apply a torque from one body to another relative to each other. Then that torque is going to be associated with uh, this line. Right, so specifically about that line. If I were to move, the, if I were to apply a torque about another line, um, it, it wouldn't be the same, it wouldn't cause the same um, torque or motion to happen with those two bodies. Okay, so bound vectors and free vectors. Um, in SymPy, we basically, um, there's nothing fancy, but when we create forces, we're going to tell it which point they apply to, and when we create torques, we're going to tell it which two bodies they apply to. 
and uh, and that's going to be how we sort of distinguish that the boundness of a vector or not. All right. So, what else? Um, if a vector is bound. And it's possible to define its moment about some point P. And this will give us sort of a more formal definition of this um, torque applied to two bodies, as I, as I said before. So we're going to define a moment M as a uh, P cross V, where P is a position vector from a point P to any other point on, on a line of action, which we'll call L of vector v. Okay? So graphically this looks like line of action L point P and vectors any vector I just call these p different um, vectors p, and so I said it could be any vector. So m in this case would be p1 crossed. Um, I'm sorry. We need the vector v that's acting along the line of action. All right. So p1 cross v equals P2 cross V equals P3 cross V, et cetera. All right, so that's the definition of, of a moment. All right, we need a bound vector V, and then so, any, in a point, and then this holds. That the cross product between any vector in that point and, uh, and, a, and a point on the line associated with V, uh, we get the moment M. Okay. Does anyone, uh, everybody, not not have that one? All right, so now um, suppose that we have a set um, called Big S, a set of vectors, Vi, where um, I equals 1 to N. Then we can define the resultant of a set S as um, big R equals the sum of all those vectors this is simply the sum of all the vectors uh, and that's um, bound or free vectors that can have a resultant. And then if each of VI are bound, then the sum of the moments about P is called the moment of the set S, a 
about P. All vectors, and we've got a total resultant from all the bound vectors. They're going to cause a total moment on that set with respect to that set about some point P. There's something uh, called a couple, and this is a set of bound vectors with zero moment, all right, zero resultant. Um, it is not a vector, but a set of vectors. And you can have as many vectors as you want. And um, the key thing is that that R of that set of vectors, S, and let's call this uh, set S again, is equal to zero. That implies that the minimum number of vectors in a couple must be two. And if that's the case, a um, couple of two vectors is a simple couple. Examples, right, if I have one vector here and one vector here, both bound along lines of actions that of equal magnitude in opposite direction, um, if I add those sum is zero. All right? So resultant of those two will be zero. Um, you know, they could be anything like so, um, or even as long as the resultant ends up being zero. Those are all examples. So now I'm going to define torque of a couple. Is the moment of a couple about a particular point? Torque of a couple is, is the same about all points. All right, so we have a resultant that equals zero, and then if I form the moment of that set, that particular couple about a specific point, then we call that a torque due to that couple. And uh, that torque is the same about all points. Right, any, any point that I pick, I end up with the same torque magnitude. Okay, so another concept. Equivalence replacement. And this comes in handy. Two sets of bound vectors are equivalent when they have two properties.
one equal resultants and two equal moments about any point. And then either set is said to be a replacement of the other. Couples um, having equal torques are equivalent. Since resultants are automatically equal, I mean, they're automatically zero and equal, and moments about every point equals that torque value. And then um, two equivalent sets of bound vectors have equal moments at every point. And so, and that's because of this. So the moment of a set of vectors about with respect to point P equals sorry, the moment of the set about point Q plus R, the distance of the vector from Q to P crossed with the resultant of S. where P and Q are different points. All right, so if I have a moment about a point P, it's related to the moment about point another point Q by this R crossed R. So the, the moment of the resultant with respect to the vector bound between P and Q. Two equivalent sets of bound vectors have equal moments at every point. Lastly, um, this replacement is uh, let S be a set of bound vectors and S prime is another set. with a couple of torque T together with single bound vector V whose line of action passes through point P then 
for and for s prime to be a replacement it is necessary and sufficient that A, the torque equals the moment of the particles, set, I mean the set of bound vectors about P, and that, that vector V is the resultant of S prime. I guess that's not A, or A and B. And this means that every set S bound vectors is equivalent to a set S prime consisting of a couple together with a single bound vector equal to the resultant of S. So what does all this mean? It means that um, if I have a collection of vectors, this set of, of bound vectors, that um, I can replace that set of bound vectors with an equivalent couple and the resultant of that set and move it to another location, right, bound to a different point. So if I want to, if I have um, a set about point P that, ha that define this uh, bound set of uh, vectors about with respect to, um, and they're bound to different points, and then I have a moment about P, if I want to know the moment about another point, all I've got to do is uh, find this equivalent couple, which has a resultant of zero, and um, use the resultant of that original set applied at the different point. You probably saw us in Dynamics 101, and this is a big, bigger mouthful that is a more general definition. Um, but the gist is let's say I have a rigid body and it has a bunch of bound vectors applied to it. Okay. And then I think about a point P here. Um, and these are the set S. So there's a moment due to S about P associated there, right? It's going to apply a moment with respect to that point P, this set of vectors. But if I can find the resultant of that set of vectors, and I'm interested in um, a point Q, what the moment beat would be about point Q, you can then um, just use a simple couple, right? So moment of S with respect to P. I'm going to screw that up. 
this is not a couple and So this is the vector from Q to P. Vectors from Q to P, the resultant of S, cross those and add them to the moment of that set of S with respect to Q to get the moment of S, uh, set of S with respect to P. Plus. So that's all there. It um, <clears throat> it's useful because you can replace a set, a bunch of vectors with a um, also with a uh, a simple couple and and a, and a single force. And uh, no matter how many vectors um, are a part of set of S here. Questions? I think I lost everybody. I think I lost myself. And uh, <laughs> we can, we can uh, look at that more specifically with, with an example next time. But I think we're, we're done for today. Okay.